Yes, hello everybody. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I am Dr. Demirdas, the clinical geneticist from the Netherlands. And I was asked to tell you all something about um, the challenges of living with a rare type of EDS. Before I go into my talk, I want also some input from the individuals themselves who, are, uh, who do have EDS and who are here today, otherwise uh, listening at home. Um, and maybe we can go to the website. I'm looking at the IT team. <laughs> um, and what I would like for you to do, uh, if you have a mobile phone or anything connected to the internet with you, to go to this website, www.menti.com. And when you're there, uh, please enter the code that you see here to go to the correct uh, questionnaire. I'll give you some time to do that. Because I wanted to know who I am talking to and also what you think that your uh, challenges are. So I'll wait a little bit. I cannot see my time though. On the third screen, I cannot see the time. Okay, so I hope with, uh, I can see 59 people in the 60. Okay, perfect. It's still going up, I'll wait just like 10 more seconds. Thank you. I forgot to take my mask off. Usually I forget to put it on. Okay, it's still going up, but because of the time, I would like to go to the next slide, please. So we're over 100 uh, people that have um, gotten into the Menti app. So the first question, I have four questions, is what type of EDS are you diagnosed with? Seventy-four people have answered. Ninety, ninety-five. Okay, I think everybody has answered. Thank you very much. Uh, and what we see here is actually a little bit what you would expect, is that most patients uh, or individuals have uh, HEDS, and that for the other types, there are less. Maybe we can go to the next one. So this is also a question that Laura asked yesterday. Uh, she asked how many of you uh, did it take more than 10 years to get diagnosed? I was wondering um, to get a little bit more insight. And unfortunately, five or more is the most frequent answer, as we would expect as well. And then the next one. And I was wondering if you do have a coordinating doctor, and if you do, who that is? I'll get uh, out behind of that thing. Um, 110, 119, perfect. Uh, and then we'll go to the last question, and that is actually, what do you think your biggest challenge is? Please don't write whole sentences. Try to use one or two words, maybe three. So we see pain, challenge of hope, stability. And the bigger words, those are the ones that are being uh, put in more often than the smaller words. So pain, fatigue, stability, chronic pain. Let's see if I can read the smaller ones. Unpredictability, gaslighting, headaches, unknowledgeable professionals. Okay. So thank you very much for that. I will try to incorporate that in my talk. Maybe we can go back to the uh, talk. Thank you. <laughs> so I will be talking about the rarer types of EDS, uh, not so much about the uh, vascular type, hypermobile type, or the classic type. And what we know, of course, about EDS is that it's a multisystemic disease. So it's not just the joints and the skin uh, in which individuals have problems. Um, 
but it's tissue fragility of also other organ systems, as you can see here. Um, and then going from the gastrointestinal tract to the vascular system, to muscles, bone, feet, uh, all these kind of organ systems are involved because they connect, have connective tissue in them. And um, we see this even more in the rarer types that the other um, organs are uh, involved. Of course, the skin and the, and the, and the uh, joints, but also other organ systems. There are in total 11 uh, rarer forms of EDS. What does that mean? So rarer forms of EDS actually means that um, they are seen even less than the three types that I named. And um, if you think about how many times do we see them, how rare are they? We know, ex for example, for the dermat dermatosporoxis type, the uh, cardiac valvular type, and also the classical like type 2, that we only know around 10 patients from the medical literature. And I think the biggest group, group within the rarer types is the periodontal type, of which to date we know about 150 to 120, 120 patients. So very rare. And this means that the knowledge that we do have is based mostly on case descriptions, either of one person or groups of uh, persons that have these rare types of disease. And um, that also means that the knowledge that we do have is quite niche. So if I see then in the answers that you have given also uh, that professionals don't know much about the types of disease, that is correct, unfortunately. So what we uh, want is that we want to improve this knowledge. And I wanted to talk about this uh, more from a doctor's perspective, because if I have to go into the challenges of every rare type of EDS, we will be here tomorrow. Um, and I wanted to talk about this using the five pillars that the EDS Society uh, names for their uh, research priorities. Because if you fill in all these five pillars, then you will have the best care for your patient. Uh, for your patient. And we'll start with education. And education basi basically is sharing information and also um, uh, uh, mm, uh, providing more information for yourself. But first of all, if we talk about sharing information, how do we do this for the rarer types? Uh, the EDS Society has working groups, as you know, and one of them is the uh, working group for the rarer types of EDS. And here you can see all the colleagues that are working uh, within that group. And what we uh, do is we share information with each other, but also, uh, as you probably know, in 2017, the uh, diagnostic criteria were um, published, and we also added for the rarer types the diagnostic criteria, but also a second paper going into more detail about what is already known about the rare types individually. We are also working uh, uh, at diagnostic pathways. We're not there yet, but what we want to do with those is how do you recognize the disease? How do you diagnose this? But after that, um, what kind of multidisciplinary uh, team would you need? And who of those people who the caregivers, when do you need them, at what frequency, and what can they do for you? So it will be both for the patient and for the caregiver. Now, if we uh, look further on sharing information, uh, if you want to know in specific detail more about the rare types, there is by Professor Moffel a nice talk uh, about the recognition and uh, how to diagnose and manage this type of uh, EDS. Secondly, what you need is more information, as I said. It means sharing what you know, that, that, that's uh, very important. But to get further into um, treatment options and also management, you need to understand the disease better. And for this, you can use basic science. And basic science for the rarer types, um, we know which gene is involved or which genes are involved. And what we uh, see is that there are two types of inheritance that you can see uh, specifically for the rarer types. Three are inherited autosomal dominantly. That's the myopathic type, um, the periodontal type, and the uh, atroglasia type. And um, what does that mean? Autosomal means that it's not sex dependent. Both men and women can get the disease. Um, and it also means, for dominant, it means that you inherit it from one parent. So you have to realize you have two copies of a gene, and um, 
in this types of disease, these types of diseases, the three I named, you see that it's usually a parent who has the condition themselves and who passes that on to their uh, child with a 50% chance. Now for all the other eight types of the rarer types of EDS, the um, inheritance is autosomal recessive. So again, not sex dependent. And uh, the difference here is that you have to inherit uh, a mutation, so a, a, a gene error from both of your parents, so both copies don't work. That is what, it, what we call recessive. And if you know the gene, it's also very easy to know which protein is involved, but then it's not that easy to understand what the effect of that is on the body. So we know for these uh, EDSs, all the EDSs to be honest, uh, is that they have either a direct influence on collagen or an indirect influence on collagen. So you know which protein is involved, but after that you don't know what, uh, what the effect is of all the molecules around that protein, and we call those pathways. And to understand those better, you can look at your patients. I will get uh, into that in the next uh, uh, pillar. But you can also use animal models. And uh, actually what you try to do is understand the disease mechanisms better by looking at your animal models. And we know that for some uh, rare types of EDAs, there are uh, animal models available and uh, looked at. Um, and the beauty about animal models is that you have more access to greater numbers. You can imagine if you're working with fish, you can make a lot of fish or mice if you're working with mice. Um, so you can have greater numbers to look at, but also you have better access to uh, where to look, uh, well, actually to gain samples. So you can look at different organs by just taking a bit of them. And of course, you would not want to do that in your patients. So for basic sciences, you can use it to understand the disease mechanisms better. But we have to remember that animals are not humans. So it's not, I see this in the mouse or I see this in the fish, so this will happen in, in my patients as well. That's not how it works. Um, so you also need your epidemiological studies to look further into uh, what is happening uh, in the body of those patients with the rare types of EDS. And uh, we are doing that, several study groups are doing that. And what, what you try to do is get as many pay, uh, people as you know with that type of EDS and then uh, do a detailed um, examination of their history, of their medical records, and of course, uh, physically, you can look just with your eyes, but you can also maybe do some tests uh, if needed. And as an example, we have done that in 2016, 2017 for the uh, classical like type one in the Netherlands. And later on also uh, in England, they did the same study. And what makes uh, this a nice way to look at it is you can increase your numbers like this, just have different countries working together. And that's very important for rare diseases is to work together because you will not be able to get large numbers if you work alone. If you are interested in uh, what we have done, there's also a talk about the classic like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and the type one. Then the last two pillars, unfortunately for therapeutics, I can be quite short. We do not have uh, curative therapeutics at this moment for the rare types of disease. This is a big challenge, not just for the patient, but also for their caregivers. Um, and we hope to get there at some point using all the pillars I just named. So the basic sciences, epidemiology, but also the information that we do already have. Sorry, I went a bit too fast. So for the social sciences, the last pillar, um, this is a very important one. I think it's a little bit underestimated uh, and overlooked. And we need social uh, studies and psychology studies uh, to know the impact on the patient themselves. So a lot of challenges that you guys named are, I think, uh, within this realm, uh, but also to see what does having this type of disease have for economic implications for the patients themselves, but also, I think, for, for yeah, society. And I'm talking about rare types, I know, but I wanted to share some preliminary data with you guys uh, that we have for the vascular EDS. Uh, these are data that Lisa van den Berselaar um, provided for us. Uh, she looked at a cohort of over 140 patients with VEDS in the Netherlands. And we also asked questions to them about their mental well-being. And what we did find, and as I said, these are preliminary data, so we have to look a little bit more uh, carefully about what these numbers tell us. 
But we see that around 10% of the individuals who provided uh, some information about themselves had a depression or several depression episodes in their lives. And the median age at which they um, had their first depression episode was around 36 years. We see that there's not a difference between the index patients and their relatives. So an index patient is somebody who is the first patient found in the family. The relatives are, of course, the ones that are found after that. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a difference, but we do find a significant difference whether or not the patient has had, had a major event. And a major event in the vascular type of EDS is basically a rupture of a hollow organ. And this can be either artery or for women, for example, the uterus, uh, men and women, in the gastrointestinal tract. So these are interesting data, but what do they mean? We don't really know yet. We have to look further into it, but um, if you look at the data for the general population in the Netherlands, uh, some state that it's about a 5% um, incidence of uh, people who have depression in their lives, but it goes up to numbers like 9% for women. So we have to little bit, be a little bit careful about what I'm showing here, but we, it is quite interesting and important to look at. And okay, so you know there's an impact, you would expect that and you see that, um, but what does it mean for individuals themselves? Well, an important uh, item in our lives is work, we believe. And we wanted to know, did their um, uh, VEDS have an impact on their work? And we did find that around 40%, which I think is a lot, uh, of the, of the uh, individuals with VEDS had some type of uh, interference with their work. So you can see that around 40% have a uh, reduced, have to, had to reduce their work, and there are even people who have stopped working around 9% or modified their work, meaning that they uh, changed their jobs. And then finally, <laughs> uh, we also wanted to see, well, why did they change or stop or reduce their work? And what you can see here is the blue ones. You would expect those are major events. Um, the orange ones you would also expect, so that's due to physical strain. But what we should not underestimate are the green uh, lines that you see here, and that's uh, the psychological effect of a diagnosis of, of yeah, in, this, in this case, uh, vascular EDS. So it does have a great impact. And these are the people that uh, we worked with for, for these data that I uh, lastly showed you. So we have a lot to do. Um, I didn't go too much into the challenges of the patients themselves. I'm sorry for that, but it was too large of a, something to talk about. But I did want to show you that we are trying to reduce the challenges for the uh, caregivers and hopefully in that way the challenges also for the patients. Thank you for listening.